Thank you, everybody. I'm very happy to be here um, today. The um, issue I have uh, been working on has, um, since it started in 2000, uh, really become um, an academic growth industry. And uh, I didn't know that when I started. Um, but 9-11 um, happened just as I was beginning uh, to get ready to go and do uh, my interviews with uh, European Muslim leaders. And I thought, oh my god, here went my research project. But that didn't happen. People were very welcoming of me. And um, you might detect an accent, and that's because I'm actually an immigrant. I'm originally Danish, um, and I came to this country as an adult. Uh, but now I'm an American, so I'm um, a Dane who became an American who works on Europe. Um, that's called import-export. <laughs> it gets even more confusing than that, because I'm also a Protestant working at a Jewish university writing about Islam. <laughs> and um, it actually turned out that this was a real asset for me. Often people would ask me how I ended up in the United States, and I would explain it, and what I was doing, etc. And the reaction always would be, that's the United States for you. It could never happen here in Europe. Um, and I actually happen to believe that's true. Um, it's a sad fact. Uh, that was only on one occasion where my background um, counted against me. I went um, to do an interview in the Stockholm Mosque, and uh, uh, people were, had been a little reluctant to meet with me, and uh, I wasn't used to that. So I was wondering what was going on. And uh, the first thing that happened was that he, the guy I was talking to looked at me and said, what are you doing writing all Muslims in Europe the same letters? So it turned out he had been to a meeting in Brussels of all places, and everybody at a meeting had received a letter from me asking for an interview. <laughs> and then he said, what makes you think I'll trust you? And I said, all right, here, here now I'm going to get it. And he said, you come from the country that's worse to Muslims in the world. How do you think I'll sit here and tell you what I think? You're Danish. <laughs> So I looked at him and I said, and you're Swedish. <laughs> so that, so much for the ethnic stereotypes. Um, in the two years um, that have passed since I started my work, obviously things have been developing uh, rather rapidly. And uh, even though my book is a quite optimistic account of what uh, European Muslim leaders really want and uh, what their aims are, uh, it, I must say that uh, things aren't going well. Um, at some level, there are a lot of things that actually are working well, but those are not the things we are looking at. Uh, integration is proceeding as we keep talking about how Muslims won't integrate. Um, nonetheless, uh, it is also clearly the case that the fight for control or the political imagination of European Muslims has intensified in recent years. Extremist groups have benefited from the growing sense that Muslims are subjected to global victimization and um, also increased heated discussion about Islamophobia and the place of Muslims in uh, Europe. Um, and a uh, number of people are beginning to say that Europe is really Christian. And uh, these issues obviously have uh, led to a quite uh, heated rhetoric. We have also witnessed uh, the increased involvement of what I call offshore political actors. And uh, by that, I mean international political groups ranging from the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a largely moderate, conservative, uh, a loose network of um, Muslim associations, national Muslim associations um, in Europe. And then there are Hizbut Tahir, which is banned in France and Germany, but very active in Britain, estimated to have about 8,000. Uh, members in Britain, and I should mention that the Muslim Brotherhood Association, which is called the Muslim Association of Britain, um, is estimated to have about a thousand members. Um, so he's put Tahir recruits primarily on university campuses and has been responsible for the development of a kind of extremist rhetoric on campuses that reminds me very much of the neo Marxist movements in the 1970s. Um, there are also, of course, uh, groups that are indirectly or directly involved with Al Qaeda. 
um, in Britain, the connections mostly go via uh, Pakistan, um, but in, in on continental Europe, most of these connections to terrorist groups really run uh, through um, the Algerian DSP, uh, GSPC, which now has officially joined up with Al-Qaeda, um, or with uh, the Bosnians or the Chechnyan uh, extremists. And then uh, uh, there are also other organizations that are more involved in proselytizing. The Tepli is a very conservative missionary movement. There's a World Muslim League. Uh, there's a Jamaat e Islami Party, which is um, uh, really part of a movement, and a South Asian movement, and uh, um, the Pakistani governing party comes from it. The, um, in addition, you have all sorts of uh, various brotherhoods, not like the mother, Muslim Brotherhood, but other, other groups uh, involved in building madrasas, involved in, um, um, and some are Shia, some are Sufi, some are Sunni. Um, so all of this uh, really contributes to the strong sense that Europe is being uh, is Islamicized. Um, and you hear that, particularly in the United States, you often hear people complaining about um, of what's happening in Europe, Fuad Ajami and Neil Ferguson are two very highly regarded. Um, one is a historian, the other political scientist, who both have argued that European Muslims are Trojan horses um, for Islamists who have been uh, rejected or ejected from the Islamic countries and because of Europe's generous laws and political for political refugees have been able to set up shop uh, in Europe and the most well-known example of that is obviously uh, Abu Hamza al-Mashri, who was very active at the Finsbury Park Mosque for a long period of time. It should be said that there was a, um, the British uh, security agencies agreed that it was better to have him preach at the Finsbury Park Mosque and keep him in the open uh, than it was to take him in um, and, and put him in prison. He eventually was put in prison. He's been put in prison for seven years on intimidation charges and for advocating um, uh, political violence. Um, I think, personally, in retrospect, that was the wrong decision because uh, we have traced more uh, would be an actual suicide terrorist to uh, Abu Hamza's camp um, than we have uh, to any other group um, working in Europe. Um, nonetheless, um, I, would, I would argue very strenuously that Fuad Ajami and Neil Ferguson are both wrong when they argue that uh, the Muslim associations in Europe are Trojan horses. Uh, first of all, uh, most of the political refugees uh, who were taken in in the 80s um, when Europe still had liberal uh, refugee laws have actually been ejected from the Islamic countries because they were liberals, not because they were Islamists. And several of them have ended up in European parliaments or as uh, well-recognized leaders of uh, various groups that are now working hard with European governments on counter-terrorism policies. Um, it is also the case that Fuad Adjami and Neil Ferguson's uh, estimations are based on uh, quite incorrect uh, figures for the size of the European population. Uh, both have argued that there is a demographic surge that are pushing European Muslims ahead and making them a real political uh, block. Um, in fact, uh, it is only in Britain that uh, Muslims have reached a size where uh, they have any political influence. There's about one million Muslim voters in Britain and uh, the only thing that they, uh, there was any sort of agreement on was um, that uh, they primarily, uh, there were some dissenters and the Iraq, opposition to the Iraq war actually pushed a great deal of support for George Galloway, uh, who was elected uh, from the Bethnal Green District in, in London. Um, George Galloway, then after he had been elected with Muslim voters, but, uh, went on Big Brother TV show where he was shown licking uh, his mistress's hand, pretending to be a kitten. Um, so he, that, that wasn't much of a political victory for anybody. Um, I think um, I'll talk a little bit about the numbers, uh, but I think it's very important uh, that we recognize we actually have no idea how many Muslims live in Europe. So any numbers uh, that I now will proceed to give you have to be taken with a very large grain of salt. They're all based on very inaccurate estimates, uh, based on demographic predictions about how many 
immigrants came from various countries that were primarily Muslim, and then you have used that to estimate how many children they might have had and uh, how many people that eventually ends up being. Uh, the, the, the view is, the consensus view is there are 15 million Muslims in Western Europe, uh, which vary greatly by country to country, but in some countries they're 2%, in some countries they're less than 1%. Uh, the Netherlands has the largest Muslim population, about 8% of the population. Um, but if you go to the UK, for instance, um, the reason that uh, Muslim uh, voters can matter in Britain is because of the electoral system. Um, as you know, Britain is the only country in Europe that uses a plurality, which means that in, because of residential segregation, there are particular electoral districts where Muslim voters can determine who gets elected. That's why George Galloway will never be a political party. Um, the, um, so about, we say that there are about um, 3% th of the British population who are Muslim. If we, we, eat, we have really no idea how many Muslims there are in France, but we estimate between 5 and 6 million. But some demographers say there's only 2.6 million, in fact. Um, it is true, uh, and I should ask to have the pictures come up now, uh, have a picture show, and I'll ask you to just look at my pictures as I speak. I'm sure you can... Um, eat lunch, watch TV, and check your email at the same time. And I'm only asking you to do two things, watch and listen, so that'll probably be OK. Um, this, the pictures will speak for themselves. Um, we do have um, highly concentrated neighborhoods um, where, you, where Muslims become very visible. And uh, pictures like this one or uh, this one really pretty much describe uh, the European nightmare of uh, what Muslims will do to um, European values about gender equality and uh, citizenship and uh, participation in the public arena. It should be said that there, we do not know how many Muslims actually uh, are really observant in this way. Uh, it is the case, though, that there are many young women who are beginning to dress like this young woman whose mothers never wore. Uh, the, the, the niqab or the headscarf. And uh, pretty much uh, most sociologists who work with these uh, groups um, and have interviewed people expect that uh, in another few years, uh, probably um, these sorts of religious dress will come off again. Um, Britain had the first feminist Muslim movement that said that as Muslim women, it was a good idea to start putting on the headscarf to show who you are. And now they're writing about how tired they are being dressed in black all the time. Um, so I think that there, it's important to understand that there are very different reasons for wearing uh, religious dress. Some have to do with uh, religious interpretation. Some have to do with intimidation from the men folks and the families. And in other cases, putting on religious dress is a very European uh, decision born out of desire for self-expression. Um, it should also be said that uh, we do have neighborhoods where integration very much is a problem. Uh, we have what we would call in American uh, terminology uh, majority-minority districts uh, where there are public schools that are majority Muslim. And these are, of course, issues that cause great consternation um, in, in, in urban politics. Uh, the, uh, very few European Muslims are of Arab origin, perhaps 20%. Uh, the migra migratory patterns have created a very uh, diversified picture of who European Muslims are. Um, in, in, in France, m most Muslims are North African descent. In Britain, most are from, uh, the, from, from the Indian subcontinent, from Pakistan, Bangladesh. Actually, Bangladeshis are the single biggest group. Uh, but um, East Asian, um, East African Asians are also a very large um, group among um, the British uh, Muslim uh, and very, very, very prominent in the political leadership. Uh, in, in Germany and in Netherlands and in Denmark, Muslims are often of Turkish uh, origin. The, um, in my, um, my work was uh, based on uh, the presumption that if people had decided to come to Europe, it didn't make much sense that they would harbor such hostile views of Europe. So uh, when I started my research, my basic premise was to test 
are the uh, clash of civilization thesis. And uh, there have been many people who have articulated this view. Shield Capel says Europe has become a battlefield. Samuel P. Huntington famously said that Europe is facing with a clash of civilization. And bar borrowing somewhat from Bernard Lewis, he said that um, where the, uh, the um, minaret meets the cross, the, the minaret will strive to dominate. Uh, likewise, the former chancellor of Germany, Helmut Schmidt, has said that uh, peaceful accommodation between Islam and Christianity is possibly only in authoritarian states. And he mentioned Singapore as an example. Um, I, my book does not bear this out. Uh, in fact, I think these sort of apocalyptic pronouncements are very counterproductive. Um, my general thesis is that uh, Muslims are um, a new interest group in Europe and uh, a new political constituency. It's a small minority, which makes it more difficult um, to find ways to come to, uh, nego to negotiate uh, what needs to be changed in terms of public policies. But ultimately, the need for change is required because Europe does not have a First Amendment tradition, does not have all of the uh, rules and regulations that we associate with uh, the separation of state and church, which in this country has created a broad umbrella where Muslims have basically moved in and just become one new uh, faith along a whole line of faith. Uh, there's uh, no similar models for how Islam can develop as a secular religion in Europe. And uh, one of the reasons that there is so much difficulty is that, in fact, um, changes have to be made in Europe in order to make it possible for Muslims uh, to develop the institutions of their faith. And all of these problems, of course, are tied up with the presence of extremists as well as the global questions about what is actually going on in the world uh, between Islam and the West. Uh, the when I did my work, I wanted to understand what uh, the emerging political elite thought about these issues. So people always ask me, why study the elite? Well, one reason is I'm a political scientist, and that's what we do. Um, I can't uh, do public opinion surveys because it's phenomenally expensive, and um, actually um, the methodological obstacles to surveying the opinions of um, a minority group as small as Muslims are in Europe uh, are very, very difficult. Uh, the Gallup organization has just uh, tried to develop um, the, the tools for doing it and have found itself stymied um, and had, in fact, to give up um, interviewing Muslims in Berlin because there are so many people who refuse to talk to them. And part of the problem is um, the uh, degree uh, of uh, many people, if you don't have citizenship, you're not uh, very willing to go and explain to anybody what your views actually are, because the citizenship procedures uh, require uh, proof of sufficient assimilation, and particularly in Germany, any affiliations with any type of, of uh, Islamic fundamentalist group, which is defined very broadly, is um, by itself a reason for you to lose your job working for the government. There have been instances of this that have been highly publicized. Um, the Gallup organization did a little better in France and was able to do it, but we are still awaiting uh, their results. Uh, Pew did a study uh, in a few countries, but had to oversample very seriously in order to get a sufficient number of Muslims in the polling. So if you see anybody saying that they have polling results, mistrust them, all right? Um, if you do random polling, you get only two or three Muslims in your poll. You can't just, and then you can't make any generalizations based on that. Um, so I wanted, partly for practical reasons, but also for some theoretical reasons, uh, to know what um, uh, Muslim leaders thought about um, the class of civilizations. Was there one? Uh, how important uh, is religion? How important is Islam for them? Uh, what uh, do they actually want? And um, in part, that's because any solution to these issues that will come about will have to be negotiated with Muslims. And um, in total, I spoke with about 300 individuals in six countries. I sp spoke with 125 people in face-to-face -face interviews. And the rest I surveyed um, as using uh, various uh, sort of innovative uh, mechanisms called email. And, uh, um, the telephone, <laughs> uh, and used a standardized questionnaire. 
And uh, I have since seen many of the people I talked to rise to prominent positions. So I find myself um, um, quite satisfied, actually, I have to admit, to see that um, my, my, my choice of looking at the elite actually has, uh, has paid off in the sense that uh, more and more people are moving into electoral office. There were 25, 25 Muslim members of the six, in the six countries I went to, uh, members of parliament, out of a population of uh, some uh, 12 million people. Um, so uh, we will see more uh, as people get the right to vote. Um, it was interesting to discover also that one or at most two out of every five leaders were native born. Um, this uh, was a big surprise uh, to me and to, because um, most of us working in the field have presumed that Europe was just like the United States in the sense that it is the children of, of previous generations of migrants who now have gone through the university systems and uh, used uh, the, the power of the welfare state to integrate and bridge classes to rise in society and as assume responsibility uh, for, for speaking out um, for, for their group. And that happened not to be the case. Um, and instead, it was pretty typically the case that the people who uh, now are political leaders had, a, had arrived at their political commitments prior to coming to Europe and had been educated middle, and were primarily middle class people before they came. In other words, they already had the self-confidence and the personal skills and tools to be able to stand up um, and, and stand for election. Uh, many are extraordinarily talented people who have uh, become citizens and learned the language in the span of a little more than a decade. Uh, the, um, um, it turned out also that one of the consistent findings I had was that the people who were um, themselves immigrant tended to have um, a much uh, calmer view of things than the people who were native born. Uh, the native born young people would say, I've done everything you told me to do. I got my university education. I'm here. I can speak the language, address like you do, and I can still not get a job. And everywhere I go, the Muslim label is thrown in my face. I have been lied to. Promises were made, and you're not keeping them. And they were very angry indeed, even very middle class, very successful young uh, people. One actually is a, a Muslim parliamentarian from the Christian Democrats um, who runs a security company uh, specializing in electronic reading of uh, various kinds of interesting um, technologies we need very much these days. Um, the older generation said, look, I'm sitting here telling you what I think. If I had done that where I came from, I would have been put in prison. So as far as I'm concerned, things are going well. Uh, and that has led me to the conclusion that European governments have better hurry up and get to talk very quickly because things, uh, the, the general uh, uh, radicalization that we are watching is not just a radicalization that takes the form of extremist groups, but it also takes the form of more mainstream and non-religious expressions of just generalized anger. Um, so how important is religion for people who have uh, gotten themselves appointed or elected to public office? Uh, I did not want to take for granted that because people were Muslims, they, their faith was, was very important to them. So I asked nosy questions about how often people prayed and uh, what, how important Islam was. And there were some surprises because... Um, um, three out of five said that Islam was very important to them, which means um, two out of five said it was not very important. But uh, nonetheless, it was, uh, the number of people who said it was very important was a little higher than I personally had expected. And you often see in the European press the notion that a good Muslim is somebody who has let the religion behind them. So in other words, in order to integrate, you've got to let go in Islam. That doesn't appear to be at all true because the people... I were talking to were members of parliament, there were highly educated people, middle class people, and um, Islam was important to them. Um, among the very religious, uh, interestingly, most said that they belong to the political center or the left. There are a lot of very religious Muslims who are voting for the Green Party in Germany. Some of them are also deciding to vote for the Christian Democratic Party. And they often would tell me, well, really, the, Democrat, the, the Christian Democrats are the right ones for us because they have the right idea about faith matters, but they uh, just can't stop talking about Christianity. <laughs> In the Netherlands, um, two Muslim 
members of the Dutch parliament are elected from the Christian Democratic Party. Um, that is probably not widely known, but the Christian Democratic Party has actually decided to have a broad umbrella of its understanding, the Dutch Christian Democratic Party, of what it means um, to be um, a religious party. The, nonetheless, it's quite clearly the case that uh, the reluctance of the political parties to absorb Muslim members and put Muslims up for election, in part because the parties expect that voters won't vote for them, not unreasonably expectation, considering that between 15 to 25 percent of European voters express highly hostile views of Muslims. Um, but nonetheless, this means that a lot of the political activity is uh, displaced outside the established political system into various, uh, uh, various other groups. Um, and uh, it's interesting to see that, uh, that I went and talked to most of these uh, national associations. And with, with the exception of um, the Muslim Brotherhood organization, which tended to conduct business in Arabic, which I don't speak and don't understand, but uh, I looked at what was going on around me, what language was being used in faxes, in the machines, et cetera. And uh, they do tend to speak Arabic, um, but they also have spokespeople who speak fluently um, French, English, German, whatever. Um, most, of, most organizations actually do conduct business in the, in the native language, in the national languages. Um, and that's because European Muslims are so extraordinarily diverse that the only language that everybody has in common is, in fact, Dutch, um, English, French, Danish, Swedish, et cetera. Um, and this also somewhat contradicts some of the alarmist reports you, 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 you read in the papers. Um, they, there are about um, 8,000 mosques in Western Europe. Um, that's an estimate based on security uh, agencies' um, studies. We don't really know. There might be 10. This might be an undercount. But that means that um, there are probably about 12,000 imams um, in, and that's probably an undercount too. So let's say 15,000 imams in Western Europe. Out of a population of 5 million, you can see that um, the prospect for the future is actually that there's going to be a lot more mosques built and a lot more imams needed. Uh, and uh, I should add also that while priests and pastors can be educated at the public universities, 90% to 95% of the graduates from the theological faculties of Western Europe do become pastors or priests. Well, there are only two schools this far that have started Islamic chaplaincy programs. One is in the Netherlands, in the University of Amsterdam, and another is uh, Loughborough University um, in, in Britain. Uh, their graduates um, do not get jobs in imams because they are educated people and they expect working conditions that pay a proper pay, and there are no mosques that can actually do that. They tend to get employed by prisons and hospitals and private schools. Um, so you can see that the issues that um, have been so contested are by no means uh, resolved. And uh, I think we uh, are looking forward uh, to a period of uh, heightened disagreement and heightened conflict um, on these issues. I'm sorry to be so pessimistic. But uh, the good news in all of this is also that um, one of the unexpected consequences of the uh, uh, seven seven bombers and uh, the, uh, uh, the the March 11th bombers in Madrid has been that European governments have decided to finally come up with po policies for Muslims. So today, every time there's a proposal arriving on the table of ministers for building domestic um, imam programs or for providing for public financing for the creation of mosques, it invariably arrives with the endorsement of the security agencies. And in fact, uh, Sir Ian Blair is now one of the strongest advocates in Britain. He's the chief of the Metropolitan Police for the need to consider social policies an integral aspect of counterterrorism. The other positive news is that the diversity of who the Mo European Muslims actually are is becoming clear. There is not one particular group that speaks for Europe's Muslims. Europe's Muslims are distributed across the political spectrum from, from the Greens to the Social Democrats um, to the Christian Democrats and to people like George Galloway and the Respect Party. Um, so whatever happens, um, 
I think uh, it doesn't much look like a class of civilization. Uh, it looks instead as an extraordinarily difficult and complicated question about the place of religion in Europe and the question of what does uh, religious equity mean in societies that because of immigration have become religiously, uh, pro uh, now have religious pluralism. Um, so I'm sorry, I spoke a little too long, but I hope uh, we can have a discussion. So. Thank you very much.